everybody. I want to first um, acknowledge my colleagues who graciously invited me to share this uh, master class. I want to acknowledge uh, Dr. Sharon Stein, Dr. Santiago uh, Guterres, and as well as Dr. Julian Evelyn Da Silva for uh, providing me with the honor to share with you some of my reflections, meditations, and contemplations around the question of internationalization of higher education. I am very grateful um, for the time uh, to you, the audience, the viewers, uh, for allowing me to um, connect with you as I share some of these ideas. So first of all, what I wanna do is I want to share a quick poem. <clears throat> and this is a poem by Thich Nhat Hanh, who is a Vietnamese peace activist and a Buddhist peace activist, I should say, who recently passed away. And I want to quickly read this poetry because it contextualizes the larger framing of my uh, class today, if you want to call it. He says, if you are a poet, you will see clearly that there is a cloud floating in this sheet of paper. Without a cloud, there will be no rain. Without rain, the trees cannot grow. And without trees, we cannot make paper. The cloud is essential for the paper to exist. If the cloud is not here, the sheet of paper cannot be here either. So we can say that the cloud and the paper inter are. Interbeing is a word that is not in the dictionary yet. But if we combine the prefix inter with the verb to be, we have a new verb, interbe. Without a cloud and the sheet of paper, inter are. And I share this with you today because as you are listening to me, we are hopefully interconnecting and in are interbeing. And I wanted to share this poem because I, it helps to contextualize not only my talk, but also to share the context of my own interbeing. So on, the, on your left side, you'll see a topographical map of what we call today the Bengali Delta region, or in the English language, we call Bangladesh. Now, if you look at this area, this is really depicting the Himalaya mountains. And this whole region is a product of the Himalayan mountains uh, um, ice caps melting. And as they run through, they create the silt as through the rivers that go into the Indian Ocean. And so this region is full of rivers and water and and the rivers carry with it silt, which produces this land. And so this is the region of the world that my ancestors come from, um, or what I'm led to believe, okay? Of course, our ancestors are probably from different places, but for me, this is where I come from. And I say this because without the Himalayan mountains, I would not be here. Without the water, the land, the soil, I would not be here talking to you. So this is where my ancestors come from. Here you will see another island and an island I'm sure many of you are familiar with. And this is the island that I was born in. So my ancestors come from the Delta region, but this is the island I was born in. And today, because of this island where I was born, I have something called the coveted British passport which allows me the privileges. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. But this island is very powerful, not because it was where I was born. It also shaped my family's trajectories, but it also has a long history of its interconnection with this area of the world. It also has an interconnection with this land, which was its first colonial site, if you wanna call it. <clears throat> so these two pieces of land, Fauna, vegetables, plants, animals, all nourished my interbeing, okay? 
here's another land. And this is the land which many of us call the Middle East. This is where I grew up. And so when I grew up as a child, I grew up among the deserts, the sands. I was used to playing with sand and that has shaped and the fauna and the flora, as well as the water are in that area, nourished me and fed me to who I am today. Finally, here you'll see a part of what the Anishinaabeg people call Turtle Island. And I am right now residing in this region, which we in the English language or the white settlers call Michigan, the state of Michigan, which is, uh, and I am currently around this area on Anishinaabeg territory. But interestingly, right across this region, which is also part of Anishinaabeg territory, is where I did most of my post-secondary education. Now you will notice a couple of things. I did not introduce myself in terms of which institution I come from. I did not introduce myself from which country I came from. What I introduced myself is in relation to the land, to water, to the plants, to the animals that nourished who I am today. And to me, this signifies the notion of interbeing, that we as beings cannot be without our interconnection with the other than human beings. Yet, it is this notion of interbeing, our interconnection, not with just each other, but with other than human beings, that these regions are nowadays labeled by countries, nation state markers. These are markers that we as human beings have imposed on to the planet. And to be honest with you, when I was trying to find images to share with you of where I come from, it was difficult without the language of nation state maps mapped on to the globe, okay? So why am I here today? I'm here to share with you some of my ideas about envisioning the invisibles. Jackie Alexander, in her provocative book, Pedagogies of C Crossing, provokes us to question our modern reference to categorize the world and tasks us to consider the invisible world's effects because like the wind, it cannot be seen, but indeed it creates a tornado. And what I am here to share with you is to discuss an invisible world effect, an invisible, like the wind, it creates a tornado. And that is the nation state ontology. In other words, the nation state as these boxes that we use to navigate and map onto the world but also shapes our way of being and knowing the world and the way we interact with each other, both the human being interconnections, but also with the non other than human being interconnections. And what I wanna talk about is the, the consequences of this nation state tornado. On the one hand, it's very visible, but because it's so visible, it is like a background noise that we just take for granted in the internationalization of higher education research, okay? So I want to remind us, this is the way the world is perceived if we were to look from an alien's point of view, an alien meaning someone from out of this planet. But these images here is what we in internationalization, as well as those of us who are stuck in a human world sense of the world, anthropocentric, see the world as a planet that is divided by these so-called national containers. And you'll see this image that I sure share here. And the reason I share this image is because a national container is like a container. It both tries to protect what's inside and try to, um, separate from what's inside to the outside, but also what it's doing as you look at the container is that it is a self-contained entity, okay? And that's what we assume national containers are, self-contained containers, okay? And so what I wanna do throughout this talk is to problematize 
these national containers that are pervasive in global higher education policies and practices, particularly through the discourse of internationalization. And so to do that, first we need to ask, where does this idea of international even come from? And it's very interesting because I personally have been interacting with this notion of international for decades all my life, but I never questioned until recently, where does this even word come from? And so I found out, and maybe my research is not perfect as I'm not the expert, I'm sure there are others who could speak volumes about this, is that the word international is a new adjective that was coined by an English philosopher and jurist, Jeremy Bentham, from the word to, to add the adjective international to the word law. He was a legal scholar. And he wanted to revise the concept of law of nations because what he was trying to do is to think about legal systems for bodies that may not necessarily bodies that not, may not necessarily be just bound to a particular sovereign space, but what about bodies as they went across different sovereign spaces? And this is important that it, he was trying to gesture towards the law governing relationships between sovereign states. And now what does this presume? And this idea of the word international that is prevailing internationalization, and I'm, I, I, and I'm not sure if there are probably scholars in internationalization who goes and looks at the etymology of this word international because internationalization is simply a verb version of this adjective called international. But on the background noise underlying the word internationalization, international even, is this idea of a sovereign sovereign space or sovereign state that I'm calling the national container. But Jeremy Betham's idea of a sovereign state was even pre was preceded, preceded by a different, uh, by a, another history, a European history. So the way we think about the nation state categorization of the world is a category or the nation state category container model of the world was something that was constructed in Europe and has been imposed through coloniality of power as ontologies of space around the world. But it is shaped by a Westphalian framework of sovereignty and governance. And this is tied to the Westphalian treaties, though the Westphalian framework is not necessarily the same thing as the Westphalian treaties that were established in 1648 as a result of a 30 year war that happened through between empires because there wasn't like the modern nation state to begin with at that time. There were a lot of war, religious wars. And in order to contain and move on from those wars, folks in Europe came up with this idea of, Westphal of Westphalia assumptions, or I should say Westphalian framework. And what does this framework assume? And it assumes that nation states are primary actors. They are agents, they're agents, and that they are sovereign authorities within their borders. So in other words, the nation state or the state becomes the secular force that only shapes what happens within these borders, okay? Now, this has a number of consequences. Because of this Westphalian framework, again, this is a framework by a social group in the world. Before there was kingdoms, towns, things like that, but then came this social political arrangement of the so-called modern nation state. Because of that, now we have understandings of native and foreigner that presume and derive from this nation state ontology. So in other words, human subjectivity today is tied to self other constituted by nation state categories. In other words, even when you're asked the question, for instance, one of the challenges I have, given that I grew up in different parts of this planet, is when you're asked, where are you from? Oftentimes when we respond, especially when you're crossing borders, is we usually affiliate or are told or asked, basically, which country are you from? And it's interesting because depending on race, gender and class and all these other things, even though I may say, for instance, I am Canadian, people will still ask me, where are you from originally? 
because again, this idea of identity is tied to particular parts of the world that are tied to particular national containers. So human subjectivity is tied to self and other constituted by nation state categories. But in, in doing so, what it does is that it creates these dichotomies between migration versus mobility, the domestic versus the foreign, nationalism versus cosmopolitanism, majority versus minority, us versus them. In other words, these so-called verses, these binaries, these categorizations, underlying them is the nation state category, okay? <clears throat> So this invisible nation state ontology, what I'm saying is a way of knowing and being. It's not just a category, we live it. It's a convenient tool to categorize oneself in the world. When we ask people, when we say international students, international faculty, whatever, we're often creating these identity markers based on our own notions of what is local national citizens, right? Um, so it becomes a very convenient way to label the world, to, to again, anthropomorphize the world through these national container boxes. But they also provide a lot of pleasure too. Their attachments to these particular national containers give us also material, symbolic, and affective value. There's, you know, I don't wanna deny, we get a lot of privileges in our other words, in terms of security, so-called peace, so-called privileges, just like I said, um, you know, being Canadian, being Bangladeshi, being American, there's a lot of these things. And that's one of the reasons why people are mobile from one region, one part of the planet to another in order to become affiliated with particular national containers because it provides them with certain kinds of privileges. And I'm saying this as someone who comes from an ancestral background of Bangladesh, how many Bangladeshis move out or people from the global South go and live and try to immigrate or emigrate and become so-called citizens of first world citizens, first worlds, in order to be able to then carry those privileges they, they wouldn't have. In other words, the nation state to begin with, the way it was built, the system itself already had hierarchies, which are tied to coloniality. But also the nation state provides us the means of agency. It provides a self-determination. But again, I want us to step back and ask ourselves, what does it presume? It presumes a world that is spatially divided by this notion of sovereign containers that are interacting with each other. And those who are inside these sovereign nations are interacting with each other. Hence, we call that international. So what is international? An international, if you look at up in a Google search, is this signifier for this idea of a process or a label tied to some kind of phenomena that goes in between two or more nations. Again, nations is the underpinning background noise. Nation state is the hidden or taken for granted container through which we create these so-called international labels or what we consider international partnerships, what we consider to be mobility, things like that, okay? So one of the works that I have been focused on, given my background, like I said, my interbeing, is that we, with my colleague, Adriana Kizar, we introduced this idea of methodological nationalism. Now, having said that, we are not the only ones who talk about methodological nationalism. There are many people who are talking about it in different ways in different disciplines. But we brought this idea of methodological nationalism in terms of thinking about it in the context of higher education research. There were others who've done that, such as Roger Dale, Susan Robertson, and, and of course, Simon Margins and many other colleagues who've done this. But what we've done is we've focused it on terms of higher education research, particularly globalization of higher education. And so what is methodological nationalism? It is this assumption, which is to what I was saying earlier, that national containers are these, these containers are the natural category for what we consider a society. So when we're talking about societies, we're not talking about a global civil society. Oftentimes when we're talking about, and by we, I'm talking about higher researchers, I'm talking about colleagues like me 
who've been trained in the Anglo-American world, perhaps others may think differently. But oftentimes the dominant discourse is when we think of society, it's usually something that's bounded in the national container. And how do I know this? Is because how we define society has implications for what constitutes social players and processes in higher education policies and practices. And so for instance, when we in higher education research, for instance, how we're funded is shaped by the national container. Because for instance, the American government will fund what I do inside the US or for the US. Similarly, UK government, Australian government, Chinese government, Japanese governments. In other words, the, the state reproduces methodological nationalism through the ways they even fund. In other words, if you look at a lot of the higher education policy research, they tend to be very much focused on policy. When we talk about policy, we're often talking about national or state level or local policy. We're not talking about the global. Um, but also the way we think about the responsibilities of higher education institutions. We, we say global as something separate from what we see as internal society. In other words, Chinese society, Japanese society. You know? So, but more importantly, the notion of identities are shaped by this idea that a society, in other words, our social development, our identity, our subjectivity is shaped by what's happening within these containers. Now, there are two problems with methodological nationalism that we articulate in our article. Number one, as I said earlier, it assumes that social processes arise from within and are internal to the nation state. In other words, you became an American student because of what's happening inside America, not because of America's imperial power all over the world. I became British because of what happened inside the British, not because British was tied to empire. Okay, so I'm just using those examples as, or uh, Australia being a white settler nation state, how it, it became Australia by its internal, but not that it, it was tied to empire building and, 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 and genociding folks, indigenous folks, right? The second thing is, and as, as I was providing an example of earlier, is that it has been all, it has been historically and currently reinforces um, power relations within the nation state and elsewhere. Um, a nation state was constructed, a nation was often codified based on a particular monoculture, i.e. a particular dominant religion, a dominant language, a dominant ethnic group. Um, those usually, first it started with religion, but now it's become language, it's become ethnicity, things like that. And so in many ways, what happens to those who do not fit in this so-called national imaginary? And that's what I mean by power relations get reproduced, not just within, but also with people elsewhere. Because if you don't fit in it, you don't get the so-called privileges of this so-called national container state, okay? So how does this national state come to being in higher education practices and policies? And what I wanna do here is quickly share with you a couple of examples that come from my recent work. And what I'm trying to say is that methodological nationalism is not something that just reproduce this national container model of the world that I would say has consequences for our interbeing with each other, doesn't just come across through just research or state level. It comes across not as an abstract phenomenon, but arises phenomenologically in everyday global higher education encounters. And this is what we focus on in a recent paper that just came out um, called Bringing the Nation State into Being where me and my colleague, Adam Grimm, uh, wrote a piece that's coming out in Globalization Societies and Education Journal. And we, I think we have that as a suggested reading <clears throat> for this. And here we're just going to share with you some examples to highlight how this nation state category is taken for granted and emerges through affect. In other words, it is ontologized through our emotional connections to this category. So the first one is a narrative that I'm going to, that I put here, that I'll share, that came from a study that I did on uh, the role of temporality, the way we make and relate to time in a global South context like Bangladesh. And I interviewed um, 22 academics. And this particular interviewee was a senior scholar who was a Bengal, who identified as a Bengali Muslim, uh, worked in a public university in, in social sciences, but has mentored many students to go study abroad. And so when I asked him 
why do people go abroad, number one, but why do people may not come back, which was what he was talking about, what was going on? And so he was then sharing with me some of the geopolitics of knowledge. And one of the things he talked about, which was very salient and what we share here, is that he was talking about his own experiences when Asia was not on the rise at that time. And he got a scholarship for his PhD to go study in a full scholarship to go study in his area in Malaysia. And he here shares with us his experience of how when he took the letter, his letter of acceptance to his supervisor, um, who is also Bangladeshi at this public university, their response. He asked, so he, I'm going to share the quote. He asked me where. I still remember the day. He first saw the offer letter from Malaysia. It was in the new field then. I didn't think about the priority, the hierarchy, or the ranking. He just took the letter and threw it away. Told me, Malaysia is not a place for doing a PhD. It's a place for going on vacation with your wife and children. Not one professor let us write to a university in Japan. Instead, they told us to do our PhD in Western Europe, but not in Asia. Now, this is a very, very powerful narrative for me. Um, Borhan's grad school experiences, you know, emerged before the rise of age, higher education. But what we're seeing here is a couple of things. How, cert, how nation states become the purviewer or the criteria to then articulate where is good higher education institutions and where it isn't. So some national containers are considered to be knowledgeable in places where you can study or become better, while others are considered spaces, become the spatial signifier for leisure. But what's interesting in this narrative is that the nation state and higher education institutions come to being they emerge together because higher education destinations are tied to national containers. And so he talked about how his uh, particular professor who, who shared this, who wanted to throw away the letter, came, did his PhD in Canada and believed that he should have gone to America for, for, his, for his work. So this is just an example how in our everyday encounters with each other, whether supervisor students or other students, how the nation national container emerges as a means to make what is the legible or legitimate place to go study? What's a legitimate place to go for leisure? Gets codified or becomes intelligible through the national container. Interestingly, when we asked them because he was talking about how many people Bangladeshis go away, but do not return, but he did return. So we asked him, why did you return? He says, but I am a freedom fighter as well. Since I come back to the country, ignoring all the money and recognition, this was for building my country with education and research. And this is very interesting because here, what he sh his narrative suggests is that a nation state is also a signifier. It becomes a site for constructing the collective we, an entity that you give back to or evoke one's pride. The nation state here is an entity that also requires self-determination because he uses the word about building. It requires building and continual maintenance. So in other words, through this narrative, we see how nation states are thus work in progress entities that require intervention through bringing knowledge from one place to another. So this is, so again, my point of sharing these narratives and what we articulate in the paper is how one desires for how we move and what we do is shaped by how we perceive ourselves in relation to this national container, the nation state. So in other words, in these everyday phenological activities, the nation state way of knowing and being constantly reproduces itself. Here's another example. And this is coming from the recent um, Indian uh, national education policy that has been just uh, instituted by the Modi government. <clears throat> And these are some excerpts from their part where they talk about internationalization, the policy document. 
So here we hear from the policy document that India will be promoted as a global study destination, providing premium education at affordable costs, thereby helping to restore its role as a Vishnu guru. An international student office at each higher education institution hosting foreign students will be set up to coordinate all matters relating to welcoming and supporting students arriving from abroad. Here, nation state has become a moving entity, in other words, using the word promoted. Yet also, it's a container that receives, it's a destination, okay, that will receive certain bodies. But it's also a corporate entity that provides affordable and premium education. But also, it's not just an entity that is a destination, but that's moving, that is a corporate entity. It's also meant to be a pedagogue. What is Vishnu Guru? Vishnu Guru means a teacher and reformer of the world. India is also a container where higher education institutions reside. India is also a host who does all this that the policy proposal is suggesting to welcome guests from various parts of the world, okay? To continue this idea of how the nation state container gets reproduced, particularly in a policy discourse by a state, here we see how knowledge is categorized through the nation state category, such as they talk about how courses and programs in subjects like India, Indian languages, Ayurvedic medicine, yoga um, should be part of it, but also internationally relevant curricula in the sciences and social sciences beyond will be fostered to attain this quality, this goal of global quality standards, attract greater numbers of international students and achieve the goal of internationalization at home. So in these policy proposals, we see how knowledge systems are constituted as being bound in particular nation, in the national container, inviting both Indian and internationally relevant curricula to attain global quality standards and attract international students. In other words, India as a national container is constructed here in relation to what is global or what is international. So my point of sharing these narratives is to show how methodological nationalism gets reproduced, how this nation state ontology, this idea of a taken for granted category emerges, morphs, and, and, and em through different scales, the individual narrative that I just shared from Borhan and his interactions with his supervisor, and then here as a state articulating its, its uh, internationalization uh, proposal for its higher education sector. <clears throat> But what are the consequences of the nation state ontology? <clears throat> How does it, in a way, going back to my starting about interbeing in the which where we're interconnected, not just with humans, but also other than human beings, what are the consequences when we reproduce this nation state ontology? And so here I'm going to talk about a couple of implications. One is I'm going to talk about research in general. Um, based on some of my earlier work, but work that people are doing for, for its consequences for knowing, but more importantly, I want to end for its consequences of being and, and envision and provide some seeds and questions for us to consider in order to move from this abyssal line of the nation state ontology. For research, when we just focus on what's happening in terms of these bounded nation states and between nation states, what we are also obscuring is the role of transnational actors in global higher education. In other words, the role, the role of say global university rankers, commercial rankers, these are commercial players like Times Higher Education, uh, Qual Qualerin Simmons, I'm, I'm pronouncing it wrong, which is some of the work I have done, but the role of international organizations such as UNESCO, World Bank, um, and by this, I'm not trying to go from one methodological nationalism to methodological globalism, suggesting that global is the most important thing. No, that's not the case. What I'm trying to say here is that when we just focus on national container and the processes between and in between, we forget there are other layers involved, other players that are involved, that are important, not only shaping what's happening within these national containers or in between national containers, but also reproducing these national containers. So for instance, if you look at OECD reports on education at glance, their bars are all based on reproducing national container models, okay? Same with the World Bank, um, same with Times Higher Education, uh, rankings and so forth. Um, another major player is social media, 
social media is reinvigorating the way we even understand ourselves and the role of diasporic societies that are all over are constituted by social media within and outside the national containment. Another area, just to give you an example from my own work about how we could help to transcend this whole called national container of the model is when we look at questions of race and racism in so-called global higher education, oftentimes we're looking at race and racism between those who are inside the national container, i.e. domestic higher education, domestic services, domestic students, domestic faculty, domestic administrators with the so-called international, the international, again, this idea of mobility between two national containers. Where, so that what it does is by talking about race and racism, that is very important to look inside. It also obscures race and racism as something that is happening all across the planet. Okay, so in this paper where we talk about whiteness as futurity, we try to demonstrate how whiteness is not just something that is bounded inside national containers. It's refracted and reflected as a global phenomenon rather than something that is just bound. And if we just look at racism, racism from this notion of what's happening inside national container, and that's often what we see in internationalization discourses, what happens is then we are in a way, our, by foregrounding that we're obscuring we're obscuring how whiteness is not just something that is stuck inside that one national container or in between two nation states. It is a transnational process and it happens because whiteness, as we argue, is a transnational force that is reproduced through the political economy, through the mobility, through the changes that's happening in global higher education. Um, and so this is just an example of how we're trying to transcend. I'm not saying we are the answer, we're just trying to provide tools to move questions of race and racism, which is, by the way, something that's always been a transnational construction, of course, by particular actors of the world who use their local histories to globalize their designs or their notions of race and impose it elsewhere, um, that we tend to dislocate that by being focused on race and racism that is stuck in national policies, national processes, national social processes, and forget. And in doing so, we only look at race and racism between two national container entities, i.e. international students versus domestic and so forth, but not look at larger processes, such as the role of global university rankings, the way global university rankings reproduce whiteness as an aspiration. Similarly, the notion of liberal education, which is what we talk about in this article. Another example is the role of popular culture. And this is a way to kind of not just transcend the notion of methodological nationalism, because popular culture, as you know, especially through COVID and so forth, this idea of Netflix, the idea of Facebook, uh, uh, Twitter, TikTok, these are not something that is bounded in a particular national container, but they are shaping our imaginaries, our imaginaries of each other. So when I talk to my students who have, uh, who are who you would consider the international students or our students here in the United States, the so-called domestic students, as they try to, as I ask them how they know about the other, it's often mediated by popular culture. It is through the movies that they watch. It is through the TV shows, such as Friends, for instance. Um, these are circulating globally. Similarly, how Hollywood shapes it. Similarly, Bollywood or Nollywood shapes the way our students, how we even each interact with each other if we've not physically gone, but our own imaginaries of ourselves in relation to the national containers we live in is mediated by, national, uh, by the popular culture, which I think is an important area for us to investigate more and more if we were to move beyond the national container model, but to see how the national container model gets reproduced through uh, popular culture. Another thing that I am increasingly working on is the role of temporality, but and this is very interesting. When we say temporality or time, time is often tied to the modern clock time as well as calendar time. How does that shape? This is not just something that's inside a national container. This is something that is shaping and mediating the relationship between each other through the planet and also creating consequences, i.e. linear notions of time, 
how it synchronizes us through GMT, things like that. How we synchronize because business is synchronized, synchronized through clock and calendar time. And by, by calendar time, I'm really talking about the Christian calendar that has become the marker through which we organize our lives around the world, even though we celebrate the other so-called New Year's. Calendar time plays a role in terms of the way we even navigate the world and each other and the way we get together. And so that's a very important thing for us to think about is that nation state containers sometimes obscure us from understanding how this clock and calendar time gets morphed and changed in these different pockets of the world. But we get obscured if we just think about processes that happen inside national containers. But there are also consequences for knowing because what about those who do not fit neatly in these national containers? such as those who are dis dispossessed or landless, such as the refugees, such as in the Rohingya right now who are residing in Bangladesh, transient migrant workers, um, what happens to them and the violence that is committed? How do they take part or how are they foregrounded in the so-called internationalization research? What about those who do not fit into national imaginaries, such as Muslim or queer bodies in India or Uyghurs in China or Mundas in Bangladesh? But what's important to think about as we're thinking about nation state ontology and trying to transcend and trying to embrace a form of interbeing is national categories determine how we allocate resources and determine mobilities. In other words, nation state as a category shapes, restricts, enables, or enhances cross-border mobility through policies such as visas. And of course, as I said earlier, some bodies based on their affiliation with particular national containers have more privileges to move across through these visa systems than others. And that's tied to a lot tied to colonial geopolitics of knowledge. But more importantly, the nation state category, the way I'm talking about it, the, the, the modern form also includes, but also exclude those who have their own national not national, but sovereign notions of sovereignty. In other words, indigenous people seeking sovereignty over their land in so-called white, in many settler contexts around the world. What happens to them as they are moving across the borders and they do not fit and have to assimilate into the so-called dominant national imaginary in order to move because their indigenous sovereignty is not recognized globally or Within. So they have to assimilate. And that's the question we have to ask ourselves as we're thinking about or reimagining the so-called internationalization of higher education. But more importantly, it has consequences for being. Where do our individual collective attachments and desires for nation state come from? Can we redirect our desires otherwise? In other words, so far what I've been talking about is you know, trying to transcend the nation state ontology, which is very difficult because it's very convenient, even for me in terms of how I identify, but that these are ontological questions that we need to address in terms of desires, because there is some kind of investment. We have some affective investments in these categories because we get some pleasure out of it. We get some material benefits out of it. So can we redirect our desires otherwise? How do these affective attachments stifle our reimagining of higher education? And most importantly, this is why I started this talk or this class, if you want to call it, about with Thich Nhat Hanh to highlight that we are interbeings. In other words, we're always interrelated, not just to each other, the human world, but other than human beings. And so what a lot of the internationalization discourses does, it, it reproduces a global or a transnational discourse, but not a sort of planetary consciousness. And so this is the important question I want to also leave you with, is how do nation state presume our human beingness and thus separation from the other than human beings? In other words, when I identify myself as being Canadian American or African American, or this notion I am Nigerian and things, how are we codifying the world, but also codifying our relationship with those who may not necessarily call themselves? I mean, I, I, I would have to go check a tree and ask them, do you identify yourself as American because you're in Michigan right now? Do the animals identify themselves? Do the air identify themselves as being something tied to? I'm sharing these questions, not to be make fun of it, but to suggest how anthropocentric these categories are. 
So how can we envision possibilities? And my goal here is not to enlighten you, in other words, give you solutions and ways of knowing to move beyond that, but rather to darken. In other words, to suggest some ways we could interconnect and plant some seeds that would grow in its own ways, not ones that I can predict or control. So here are some ongoing questions for those who want to engage in future work or future ways of knowing and being. How is the nation state performed and felt through everyday practices, objects, and policy assemblages, such as the world-class uh, world initiatives, university rankings, study abroad, visa policies, and so on? How are nation states, higher education institutions, and the global arena and its associate actors constantly ontologized, i.e. becoming, I think what I'm trying to say here is that there is no such thing as a national container that is just something that is just abstract. It is emerging and it emerges and it morphs based on the scales we're talking about, based on the context and so forth. And that, so it's important not to think of just the nation state, but things we associate with the higher education institutions, the global, the actors, how they are becoming in relation to each other as they interact with each other. But more importantly, how do we center the invisible? How do we center relationships to the cosmos, land, ancestors, other than human beings, other ontological perspectives, as we think about the abyssal line beyond the modern reference, the tornado that um, Jackie Alexander was uh, suggesting that we look at, they're invisible, but they have such a force. What about those other relationships that also have a force in our lives? How can we expand our fancies of knowledge of what we perceive to be knowledge, space and time, relationality and affect beyond the national container is another question I want to, you to leave you with. So one way to think about interbeing beyond the Thich Nhat Hanh, um, poem that I shared was that when I go next to the waves and the ocean. And you know, I'm sure many, some of you may have been near oceans, rivers, water. You know, when you look at a wave, it's very difficult to say where a wave begins and where it ends, because it seems interconnected with both the water around it, but the land. And so interbeing to me is something that a wave embodies. And the question is, how can we be waves whereby we're not separated? We are not separate from so-called nature, but part of it, our nature, are the waves. And I think that's what Thich Nhat Hanh is reminding us, is that without the clouds, there would be no paper. Without you or me, I wouldn't be here. Without the land that I've been nourished today with and your presence, these ideas wouldn't be. And so I would encourage us to seek out ways to interbe in scholarship, but more importantly, in our everyday lives. I hope, and again, thank you for your time and allowing me to be with you and interconnect. And I hope this was helpful to share some seeds of indarkenment, seeds that hopefully will shape you where you need to be. And with that, peace, and thank you again for uh, allowing me to be part of this. Take care, everybody.